Um, I'm going to talk about uh, something called Open Space today, which is a new initiative at the American Museum of Natural History, which is an open source project um, for space visualization. But I wanted to start off with this picture taken last year by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, a very high resolution picture of the Earth rising over the moon, which is really what gave birth to Earth Day 46 years ago today. Uh, this is the picture in the Hayden Planetarium. I'm used to a bigger screen, about a 68-foot uh, a, uh, dome. Um, but essentially, looking at the Earth uh, uh, from space and the visualization, but coming back down to Earth, essentially, that we're thankful, really, that we live in this ocean of air, however thin around our home planet. The Hayden Planetarium started in 1935. It was, had this uh, latest technology of a star ball uh, developed uh, at the uh, German optics company Zeiss, Optical Mechanical Beast, this is from Life magazine back in 1935. And inside the dome, essentially what you have is this projector in the middle to display the stars, an accurate data visualization, because it was a map. And the, uh, it also recreated the motions of the night sky and the positions of the uh, planets and moon and stars. But really what we began to ask as a Millennium Project is what would a planetarium of the 21st century be? And this is the old planetarium the venerable planetarium where I used to go, starting classes when I was 10 years old, being transformed into the Rose Center um, of today. And so the old place is completely torn down, built anew, with a new vision of bringing data visualization, essentially three-dimensional data visualization, through the innovation of full dome video to the dome. There we go, thanks, came back. And inside the dome, this is a view of what that looks like, but immersion in scene. And the museums of natural history across the world, highlighted, of course, with, with ours, is that, the, um, that these displays, these dioramas, are ways to transport us, take us to other places and other dimensions, essentially, across the earth and the story of life and natural history. Um, and uh, so this book by Steve Quinn, who was our curator, recently retired, um, is uh, a story of these dioramas, but walking up into them, of course, they're famously three-dimensional taxidermy, blended beautifully into paintings in the back. So what would we be doing in building this 21st century planetarium? And uh, really, the notions um, ranged and so what that would be, going from a looking up perspective to a per perspective in space. And the classic Powers of Ten film, which uh, really was a story by Kees Boke, who was uh, a Dutch illustrator and artist uh, and, and scientific thinker, uh, put together this idea of going out into space, looking to a broader and broader perspective mathematically. And then that was famously put together by Charles and Ray Eames, the design couple um, that did a lot of work with museums um, and displays around the world. Um, but also Philip and Phyllis Morrison from MIT. And Philip Morrison na famously narrated um, this piece. And as we move out, we're accelerating at, uh, by a factor of 10 in every step. But in this, um, I want to speak about Professor um, Anders Inerman, who is a close friend of mine and colleague who I've been working with for the development of interaction, data visualization and interaction. We also make our famous movies, if you come to the planetarium, but this, uh, this notion of being able to take our database of the universe that we have, this three-dimensional database, and put that together graphically into a seamless dive into the universe, if you will, was the subject of working with Professor Inman and his master's thesis student, two of whom are with us called Open Space that I'm going to get to. But we started in uh, about 12 years ago with this idea of using UniView, a universe viewer, and we started with that, and that spawned a company in Sweden. Sweden is uh, great about taking their, teaching their students to make companies from what they're doing in school. And so that produced essentially a commercial product. 
What you're seeing here was recorded live. I sat at Earth Matters Cafe on Ludlow Street, where I live, and I did about 25 takes that day for a five-minute loop where I leave, essentially, the Himalayas and move on out into space and come back to Earth. This was done for a show at the Rubin Museum of Himalayan Art for comparative cosmologies of uh, Eastern and Western, culminating in this silent film where we go out in a five-minute loop and come back. Everything you see is data. Everything you see here and data points, we're seeing the farthest galaxies that we've mapped and areas that we have not mapped. And so the limitations are those um, that are imposed by our, our process, imposed by the orientation of our galaxy that sort of blocks the views and so on. But this idea of creating a planetarium of the 21st century was to really create this three-dimensional viewing portal essentially with motion graphics on the dome so that we could really see essentially what is happening. In this case, we see the Cassini spacecraft as it orbits, color-coded for different mission phases, that this spacecraft got there and did not use fuel to change its orbit. It used 45 encounters with the largest moon, Titan, which is larger than the planet Mercury. It's second only in the solar system to Ganymede, which is larger at Jupiter. Here's one of the, uh, the um, visits of the moon Dione, uh, one of the encounters. And we were able to show what the spacecraft, where it was, but we weren't really showing what it was doing. One of the other um, exposures uh, that we had early on in the process um, to taking data visualization into the immersive dome was working with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. What you see here is something that they call teleimmersion, which is an, several different groups, all in the same database, interacting across a high-speed network at this time. But this was sort of the vanguard of what was going on in the 90s. At the time, this is what was shaping up to come up to our opening in 2000. And we worked with this team and we actually worked on some production items where we worked interactively, remotely, with Illinois. What we see here is um, the first view you're seeing of this new software, Open Space. This is open source, freely available to the world, and that this is meant to be an arena to challenge the students for their master's thesis work, but build up, essentially, a network of users because it's freely available, because it's open source. It's not subject to being a company and behind uh, a particular support structure of software. Being open source, it's available to all. But you're seeing here um, some complex work that was done initially at um, Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, NASA's uh, facility down in Greenbelt, Maryland, where they're looking at, uh, this is Communi Community Coordinated Modeling Center, where they're looking at space weather forecasting to really protect the assets which are, are out, our satellite assets across the solar system. They're looking at the propagation and modeling the propagation of solar events, and they're being observed from multiple platforms as you see. So you're seeing the different satellite views, which are observation, and then you're seeing how the model fills that in. The planets are not to scale in this, in this view. But you're seeing essentially a visualization of the density of the, uh, of the solar wind, and the, the, uh, the red uh, shape you saw was the propagation of one of those solar events. Here we're going to see a time series. What you saw before was just a, a snapshot. But here, this is this sort of revolving sort of sprinkler of the sun, it's a, uh, and then a, 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 ma a mass ejection evolving out. And also, so the sun spins in about 27 days. Here we see a simulation as it's visualized at NASA. Um, just as a cut plane, but you're seeing the inner solar system and that white line moving out is the New Horizons spacecraft on its way to Pluto. Uh, of course, it left Earth uh, nine and a half years prior to reaching Pluto. I was at the launch, it was exciting, um, and it passed Jupiter. Um, you can see a little um, divot in the path at Jupiter which was giving it additional uh, velocity to get out to Pluto. This run, which is normally done just for the inner solar system, the very inner planets that we can see here, is usually the domain of these simulations. They did a, a vast simulation to look at the propagation of solar events that would be reaching 
uh, New Horizons uh, reaching Pluto at the time of the arrival. And this was done last year, and our students um, email, uh, and, um, email and Thomas, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, email and Thomas here doing their thesis defense, but you were seeing that both on our IMAX screen um, at, in New York as well as on their dome. So this software can stretch between domes, personal displays, large scale. It uh, has that ability to essentially be a chameleon across different projection environments. Here we're looking at visualization of the Earth's magnetosphere and we're seeing field lines as well as, before you're seeing volumetrics, fully interactive. You can see the cursor even moving it around. And what just one of these would look like on the dome, this is the Earth and its, its magnetic field. We were also interested in visualizing not just where a spacecraft was, but what it's doing. And so we're looking here at the New Horizons mission, and this was done as preparation for the encounter with Pluto that happened last summer. Uh, before it reached Pluto, actually a year after launch, in February 2007, you can see here the images that were taken, and you can see the camera view here, and what we've done is we're taking the predictive um, numerical simulations of that and putting that together to visualize where the camera's looking and slugging in the actual pictures. And we can see that they, ma they matched up. And we did that in preparation for actual encounter, closest approach, on closest approach day, on July 14th in a global networked event, where on the left you see the operator sitting there. That's Michael Marcinkowski, my student uh, who had worked over a year on this, but sitting with the mission scientists. And we had a Google Hangouts going on where we had a dozen sites that were logged on together, planetariums on every continent except Antarctica, we were being guided by the scientists telling us what was going on at the time when no pictures were coming back, but they were explaining exactly what was going on. I know the time because it's time to exactly 20 minutes. So um, here we can see, um, again, another mission scientist talking to this, but this is before the images are returned. But they're telling you what is happening and the importance of the observations. And in that is a lot of human planning. In this case, we're seeing a post-encounter reconstruction. So what you're going to see here is the same thing, but in this case, the images have finally been returned to Earth. Um, we approach um, the trajectory line. We see the spacecraft. That line going off to the left is an observation of one of the instruments. But we see the uh, New Horizons spacecraft. It's about the size of a grand piano. It's, uh, the dish here is about two meters, about the size of a human being. So we see the instruments on board and so on. If we just come around here for a second, we'll go from this to looking at the geometry of the system. We have Pluto and its five moons. And we can see now that's the orbital plane of the moons. These are the lines of the views of the instruments. And this is the trajectory line. Every yellow node is an hour. So it passes through the system in just about two hours, and a lot of action is happening. We can see the orbits of the inner planet farther out, and uh, outer planets, I should say. We are seeing the orbit of Neptune, which is, of course, inside the orbit of Pluto. But we can also see how the orbit goes past the largest moon, Charon. You know, they're worried about debris, a possible ring. And now we're coming into Pluto, and this is the best images from approach and also from the Hubble Space Telescope. But now we're a day away from encounter, if you could see the encounter for the larger projection. And we're now going to do that image projection technique you saw at Jupiter. And in this case, this is the heart of Pluto right there. And we see that the image matches up right to the, the map that we see on the surface. We're projecting the images from the predicted set of orientations of the cameras at that time from the files that are published by NASA. Here we can see, it's hard to see because the, the uh, projection is smaller, but we're now looking at as we get closer to Pluto, this is the same, uh, the, the square that we see is the same field of view. It's one third of a degree of the LORI, the long range uh, uh, reconnaissance imager camera, and as we get closer, 
of course, that field of view gets smaller. We're getting a better view of Pluto. And so the imagery gets better. And so in this case, we're looking at a four by four mosaic, which is about eight in the morning on encounter day. And it's going to happen around noon, the closest approach in um, universal coordinated time. So here we just see the dance between the images that have been finally returned and the aiming of the camera. In this way, this sort of engineering visualization, we want to show how the engineering supports the gathering of the science that we're doing. We want to, we want to unpack and be able to uh, visually show within this interactive mode exactly what's going on with how we gather the science. Also, the networking capabilities, as you could see for the global event, enables the scientists to be in the loop to explain. So the scientists don't even have to be at your facility. And the lecture can be distributed across the world, as we did during Encounter Day. And so key to that is having a software that's freely available, both for schools as well as facilities. Also, the fact that this is a non-commercial um, uh, non project is that it makes it available for um, vendors that are typically competitors to one another but because it doesn't threaten their business model that uh, uh, they can sign on uh, to collaborate with us. Based on these results, um, we competed um, for a sort of announcement notification last spring, and we were awarded uh, over the next five years for development of this software. From that, we have collaboration with NYU School of Engi Computer School of Engineering, as well as University of Utah's Scientific Computing Imaging Institute, the Ski Center, and some of the top visualization researchers in the world. So we can take the latest innovations from scientific data visualization research and put that into this broader system that can do mission visualization, the volumetric rendering of not only just solar physics, which you can see there, can be applied to astrophysics in general. And again, this networking feature allowing scientists to be in the loop to explain what's going on. And um, so um, last, what I want to show is that we visualized the Rosetta mission at Comet 67P, Cheryamov Gerasimenko. It was the first time that uh, we had gone into orbit and dropped a lander on the surface. This is European Space Agency, Rosetta mission, but we're doing the same image projection technique on a model that was an amateur put together. Matthias Malmer from Sweden had devised this model from his own um, understanding of photogrammetry between the images that had already come in. And uh, I was very skeptical that the images would land on the model just right, but in fact, it really works. We're guided once again by SPICE kernels, which is an observational geometry uh, system, essentially, that is published that really uh, highly accurately portrays where the spacecraft is, the view angle, and then we can project the images. This is a very strange orbit. It's an ion-driven um, system, or, or spacecraft for the most part, but it also has thrusters. And because the gravity is so low around this object, which is about, I believe, about 30 kilometers in, in scale, um, so it could fit within the, the, the uh, New York metropolitan area. It would fit over Brooklyn, essentially. Um, and, uh, but then when it got in closest, here we're going to see a couple of the uh, close-in pictures. You can actually see sand dunes from the jetting of the, the gases on this world that has hardly any gravity and only a temporary atmosphere at times when, uh, when the outgassing is, is occurring. And again, in honor of Earth Day, um, that a lot of what we do at the Museum of Natural History is to put the Earth in context. That quote is from Carl Sagan uh, from his pale blue dot um, paragraph, of course. I don't know if you can read it, but nevertheless, this picture of the Earthrise is taken by the Japanese uh, Kaguya spacecraft orbiting the moon and that it carried, NHK had helped put on high definition camera rises and sets uh, that, uh, that they captured. And uh, a few of them 
are on YouTube at full resolution, but absolutely stunning. Our Earth in context, that's effectively what we're trying to show at the museum and bring that to the world through this new software called Open Space. If you're interested, the website is openspace.itn.liu.se. If you're interested, come up and ask me. I should have put that in as the last slide, and I didn't. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if there's any questions, I, I know that this was timed to be exactly 20 minutes, but if there are a question or two, maybe I can answer it off stage. Thank you.